John Milton was born on December 9, 1608, to a middle-class religiously Protestant family in London. He attended St. Paul's School and Christ's College, Cambridge. As a young student, he began writing poetry and training to become an Anglican priest. Even though his interest in religion prevailed throughout his life, he gave up his pursuit of the priesthood. Instead, he devoted his time to writing poetry and studying ancient and modern languages, literature, science, politics, and philosophy. Milton's interest in politics also led him to write a series of political pamphlets during the English Civil Wars, 1642-51, in which he advocated for the right to divorce and to have freedom of the press and argued that the monarchy should be abolished. After King Charles I was executed, Milton served as a Secretary of Foreign Language in the new Republican government until the monarchy was restored. At this point, Milton was considered a dangerous revolutionary. Meanwhile, he began losing his eyesight and by 1651 he had gone completely blind. Paradise Lost was published in 1667 in 10 books and later republished in a 12-book version, 1674. Comprising nearly 11,000 lines written in blank verse, the poem was immediately popular. In the early 21st century, it is regarded as the greatest epic poem in English. Milton's other works include History of Britain, 1670, which covers the settlement of the island up to the Norman conquest in 1066. A volume containing two long poems, Samson Agonists and Paradise Regained, was published in 1671. Samson Agonists focuses on the last day of the biblical Samson's life and how he regains favor with God after giving in to temptation, is blinded and is captured by his enemies. Paradise Regained tells about how Jesus resists Satan's temptation in the wilderness. Both poems are examples of Christian heroism in which characters are tempted to turn away from God, reject temptation, and then reaffirm their faith. Milton died in November 1674. Milton's works have influenced storytelling ever since they were published. Paradise Lost offers something unusual in literature, an imaginative vision of what everyday life in paradise might have been like. Furthermore, Milton used a variety of literary devices, including epic similes, long elaborate figurative comparisons that have influenced authors to the present day. In the tradition of ancient Greek epics, John Milton begins his poem by calling on the guidance of a heavenly muse to help tell his tale, stating that his goal is to justify the ways of God to man. He begins his story in Medea's res, in the middle of things. God has cast Satan and his rebel army of fallen angels out of heaven, and they are floating on a fiery lake in hell. These angels become devils, and form a council to debate how to overthrow God. Through his second-in-command, Satan convinces them that the best target is man, God's newest creation. Satan volunteers to fly to the world full of God's new creatures. His daughter, Sin, and their incestuous son, Death, help him escape from hell. The personifications of chaos and night also help pave the way for Satan to enter the new world, because they have no particular allegiance to God. God, in his omniscience, already knows that Satan will succeed in tempting and corrupting mankind. He announces that man will be punished for his disobedience, because he created humans to be strong enough to withstand temptation. He claims that his new creations will be punished by death, unless someone in heaven is willing to die on their behalf. Only God's son volunteers. Saturn lands in the new world and sneaks into the Garden of Eden disguised as a cherub. Once inside the garden, he speaks God's new creations, Adam and Eve, and is deeply envious of their innocence and happiness. Though he has a moment of doubt and almost feels love for the humans, he resolves to continue with his plan to corrupt them. 
it is the only revenge he can get against God. He overhears Adam and Eve discussing how God forbade them from eating fruit from the tree of knowledge and decides that he will trick them into disobeying God by eating the fruit. Uriel, the angel guarding paradise, realizes that the cherub is Satan in disguise and sends for the archangel Gabriel to find the intruder. Gabriel confronts him and Satan reveals himself and prepares for battle. God then sends Satan a warning, a pair of golden scales in the sky that demonstrates how pointless it is to fight. Satan flees, recognizing that God does have the ultimate power and advantage. Satan whispers an upsetting dream about eating the fruit from the tree of knowledge in Eve's ear while she is sleeping. God decides that although he cannot control their actions, he must warn Adam and Eve about Satan. He sends his archangel Raphael to discuss with Adam the idea that they have the free will to make their own choices and to warn them about the temptation they will face and its consequences. Raphael also tells Adam the story of Satan's rebellion in heaven, which began when Satan, then a high-ranking angel, became envious of the Son, who would become King of Heaven. Satan then convinced other angels to rebel against God and forms an army. Yet all angels are immortal. While they can be wounded, they can't be killed. The battle that Raphael describes to Adam seems pointless, especially because the all-powerful God can call an end to the war whenever he likes. He does so on the third day, telling his son to banish the rebel angels to hell. After Raphael finishes telling Adam the story, Satan returns to the Garden of Eden, taking on the disguise of a serpent. He finds Eve alone and speaks to her. Eve is curious about how he came to be able to speak, and he tells her that he learned by eating fruit from the Tree of Knowledge. He tells her that if she eats the fruit, she can become a goddess and gain knowledge as well. After hesitating, she eats the fruit and then offers it to Adam. Though he realizes that she has disobeyed God's orders, he eats the fruit so they will share the same fate. God then sends the son to the Garden of Eden, where he condemns Eve and all future women to experience pain when they give birth. He also condemns Adam for having to labor to grow his food and tells Eve she must submit to Adam. Satan is gleeful that he has accomplished his plan and his children, sin and death, build a bridge between hell and earth. Though Satan arrives triumphantly in hell, believing he has outsmarted God, God punishes Satan by turning him and the other devils into serpents doomed to eternally hunger for fruit that turns to ashes when they bite into it. God next orders angels to make the new world more hostile to mirror Adam and Eve's fall. The angels create storms and turn creatures against each other to create discord and suffering. Adam and Eve begin fighting and blame each other for the punishment they are enduring. Ultimately, they decide to repent to God, swearing to be obedient. God agrees to be merciful, allowing them and their offspring into heaven in the afterlife if they are obedient to him. God sends the archangel Michael to show Adam what his and Eve's future will look like. Their sons will murder each other, tyrants will rule, and biblical floods will wipe out most people. Yet he offers them hope in addition to depicting the suffering that future humans will endure. He shows Adam a rainbow meant to reflect God's mercy and biblical characters such as Noah, Enoch, and Jesus, men who will redeem humanity through their selfless acts. Adam and Avi finally leave Paradisi, accepting their fate. John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost, relies on the underlying structure of ancient epics to portray the Christian worldview as noble and heroic arguing that God's actions, for people who might question them, are justified, hinting that humankind's fall serves God's greater purposes. In his retelling of Adam and Eve's story, Milton suggests that disobedience to God leads to spiritual exile, 
allowing evil in all its manifestations to enter the world, which, in turn, offers necessary opportunities for redemption. At the poem's outset, Milton's speaker invokes the muse of the Holy Spirit to fill him with knowledge, since that spirit forms the creative force of the universe. Milton, in turn, seeks to serve as the creative force of the poem. His literary project emphasizes the idea that Christian values, such as obedience, humility, and forbearance, are of the highest importance. The main conflict of the poem involves Satan's jealous desire to corrupt God's new and beloved creation by creating human distrust in God's plan, a distrust that will lead to disobedience. Through the temptations of the antagonist, Satan, Milton emphasizes the corruption to which humans are vulnerable if they are not spiritually aware of the manipulative power of evil around them. Adam and Eve's inner struggle, an effort to resist temptation, symbolizes the innate human desire to stay loyal or true to a spiritual compass, which, in Milton's poem, is represented by God's exhortations and the messages of his angels. The inciting incident of the poem fins the antagonist, Satan, banished to hell, where he and his fellow devils construct a temple called Pandemonium, a symbol of chaos and irrationality, and then plot both to make a good out of evil and an evil out of good. Milton portrays the devil's apparently democratic decision as ironic evidence of their failed capacity for reason. Satan refuses to accept God's rational hierarchy, that the son is superior to him, and settles on irrational disobedience. In an allegory reminding the poem's readers of a conventional Christian understanding of the fall, Satan begets sin who begets death. He volunteers to corrupt God's new and beloved human beings, and a bridge is built between hell and earth. The rising action explores ideas about free will and a redemption in which God's Son will willingly sacrifice himself, God's plan for human salvation. The Son is the instrument through which God acts, and Milton shows how God and the Son work separately, yet are manifestations of the same entity working as one. Free will is one of the major themes of the poem, and Milton suggests a paradoxical idea about it. A human being is free to choose, yet is only truly free when choosing the good. Events unfold as Adam is visited by the archangel Raphael, who recounts the story of creation, reveals the primary conflict between God and Satan, and describes the latter's fall and the war in heaven. The war stands as an extended spiritual metaphor in which disobedience leads to one's blindness from the truth. Raphael warns Adam to be wary of Satan's temptations. Adam's choice will rest entirely in his own hands. At the poem's climax, Satan accomplishes his goal by convincing Adam and Eve to become disobedient. Plagued by envy and despair, Satan flatters Eve, convincing her to eat the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge. He presents knowledge as a means with which she might equate herself with God, using his perverted reasoning to demonstrate how knowledge can be used for evil. Eve, in turn, convinces Adam to join her in this act of disobedience, and he dooms himself, unable to bear the thought of losing her. Ultimately, he chooses loyalty to Eve over loyalty to God. As the pair's heightened senses take over, their capacity for reason diminishes. The further Adam and Eve drift from God, the more reduced their powers of reasoning become. In the falling action, Adam and Eve awaken to their banishment from paradise. They find themselves in a world of shame and evil, blaming each other for their condition, and sin and death subsequently enter the world. The fall, however, paves the way for humanity's redemption and salvation. Thus, Milton claims that his epic surpasses the ancient classics as it pertains to all of humankind, not to a single hero or nation. 
The Archangel Michael grants Adam visions of a future in which his offspring commit murder, as well as scenes of people living for pleasure and the flesh. Unlike Satan, Adam and Eve repent by praying to God. Michael, in the poem's resolution, recounts the idea that a Messiah will eventually arrive to reunite heaven and earth, noting that there will be much suffering before that reconciliation. Milton suggests that Adam and Eve's fall is the Felix culpa, or happy fault or fortunate fall, for God's mercy is shown. Individuals, he suggests, may hope to redeem themselves through devotion and obedience to God, forming an aspect of his ultimate plan. Comforted by these suggestions, Adam and Eve, in the poem's final scene, exit into a new world. They have been led to understand that obedience to God and his love for his creation will lead humanity towards salvation, toward regaining a paradise that has been lost.